Hi, my name is Emma Zabios. I'm an analyst for Terbium Labs, which is a dark web monitoring company. And I'm here to talk to you about Clippy for the dark web. Or more specifically, I'm here to talk to you about why there isn't a Clippy for the dark web. Unfortunately, I was disappointed to learn when I started researching the dark web that there is not a little paperclip friend to guide you through the the process of using some of the kind of complicated software that goes into using the dark web. So during this talk, I'm going to walk you through what an ease of use tool actually is, because Clippy basically is an ease of use tool. He existed to make um, it easier for you to use Microsoft um, to walk through what exactly the dark web is and why it exists, um, to walk through what ease of use tools there are already and why you might make one for the dark web. And then finally, to talk about what the consequences of making an ease of use tool for the dark web would be. So to launch off, what is an ease of use tool? You use ease of use tools every day. Here are a couple of examples that you use to use the regular internet. You can use a search engine so you don't have to you don't have to remember exactly what site, what URL you're trying to go to. You can say, I just want something I want something that has to do with cats. Can you show me anything to do with cats? And then the and then Google can bring you. Here's a bunch of stuff to do with cats. Is that what you were looking for? There's also Yelp, and Yelp basically site, site, Yelp and sites like Yelp can say like I'm looking for somewhere to eat. I actually used it to go find somewhere for lunch today, and you can say, okay, what's good in this area? And more importantly, you can trust what Yelp is telling you to a certain degree. You can, sit, you can trust that the people who are adding things to Yelp are not trying to lead you astray. And when we show up to the restaurant, it will probably, go, probably be good and will probably exist. And then finally, things like cookies that are, even though cookies are uh, sort of storing your information and can use it in nefarious ways, they're also trying to help you by allowing you to remember exact, or having your browser or website remember exactly what your preferences are. It's customizing your experience for you. So we talked a little about ease of use tools. And before we get any farther, I want to launch into what the dark web actually is, if you're not familiar with it. You've heard me mention the clear web before. Basically, it's all in the World Wide Web. And then the clear web is a subset. It's, about, it's a pretty small subset, actually. Uh, the clear web is anything indexed by Google. So anything where you don't have to know exactly where you're going, Google can, kind of, can show you the link. You can click on it and get there. The opposite of that is the deep web. The deep web is anything not indexed by Google. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily nefarious in any way. It could, just means that you, it's not publicly accessible or it's not accessible without a special software. Something like an intranet or a, or a private database that's hosted online, that's the deep web. Inside the deep web is the dark web. The dark web is only accessible by a special software or browser, and, and it's also not necessarily nefarious. Um, but it does require, it is more uh, privacy focused. And uh, when I'm talking about the dark web during this talk, I'm mostly going to be talking about a network called Tor. Tor is, stands for the onion router, which is why there are all these bouncing onions across the screen. Um, basically, when you're doing a regular, um, when you're using the internet normally, uh, and you make a request to say, I want to go to a specific website, two pieces of information about you are known. The ISP knows who you are, and they know what you're doing. Tor basically obfuscates both those pieces of information and prevents uh, your ISP from being able to connect them. It knows some, that you are using Tor, and it knows that someone is trying to go to that website, but those pieces of information don't get connected. There are a lot of really valid reasons why someone might want to use Tor. Basically, Tor is trying to protect the privacy of its users, and that's a valuable goal. It's not perfect, but it's important in a world where a lot of things on the internet are trying to exploit your information and your data. It's useful for whistleblowers. A lot of whistleblowers use Tor, a lot of political dissidents, a lot of people who are just concerned about their privacy. But it also provides refuge for a lot of criminals because they're also very concerned about their privacy. You might think, Tor sounds great. I would love to use Tor. I hate losing my data to other people. What's the catch? The problem. Usability versus privacy. Who in this room has 2FA turned on for every device or every account? How many of you, how many of your parents have 2FA turned on for every account? 
even though 2FA is really useful, it's annoying. Like there are a lot of things that improve your security online, but they also introduce friction into the experience and friction makes people not want to do something. People on the dark web are just like people on the clear web. They hate friction and they make dumb decisions because they want to avoid it. Here is basically a very simplified spectrum of usability versus security or privacy, kind of depending on how you're looking at it. Um, I'm going to fill this in later, but I wanted to show you that it really is a spectrum where you can have something that's very usable, but not super secure or private, and very secure and private, but not super usable. Um, the dark web is in this constant battle of usability versus privacy. Every tool that's made on top of the dark web can either weaken or strengthen the protections that it's providing. You see this battle come in a lot of the time with, um, with, different, with different tools that are built onto it, but I'm gonna highlight one. This is, a, this is a very famous dark web ease of use tool. It is Bitcoin. Bitcoin basically made the dark web. Uh, the, while the network existed before, it did, it, the marketplaces that have made the dark web really famous they could only exist because there was suddenly this currency, this means of transaction that was a lot easier to use than Western Union. It, it added a lot, and it was also temporarily more secure. There are a lot of benefits that Bitcoin provided. So Bitcoin kind of exploded, it launched all these marketplaces, but as it got more and more popular, people were like, I think we can build tools on top of this to make it easier to use. We can build exchanges, we can build escrow systems, we can build cleaners and foggers and tumblers so that we can, so that we can more easily conduct transactions with each other. And then suddenly, as it got more and more popular, people were, it began becoming more and more famous. And suddenly, uh, as uh, people were arrested, as sites went down, Bitcoin has become less and less anonymous. It's actually become less and less useful for the kinds of transactions that it was that it originally enabled because it with the lack of privacy has come this lack of security as it became more usable it became less private and less and like actually less functional there are tools that improve security on the dark web tor browser oh sorry tor browser which is one that i talked about right at the beginning it's a way that you access tor um, is actually an ease of use tool. It bundles all these things together so you can just open it and use it like a regular browser. Um, Tails is actually an operating system. Tails is built on top of Linux and it bundles together a lot of, um, a lot of important privacy tools so as to make it basically as easy, as easy as possible for you to make the correct privacy decisions. It's also really slow. And, and like if, if you're used to using the shiniest, newest OS, going to Tails is like really taking a step back um, because suddenly everything is slower, it's kind of, it's jankier. And it, the adoption rate of, of Tails is low, even in dark web criminal communities. Virtual private networks, which are even easier um, and more widespread both on the dark web and on the clear web, are also not adopted at very high rates. There's one stat, um, which was in my notes that I wrote down, but um, there was a study done of marketplace of underground carding marketplaces and forums where they basically lurked there and looked at what different security behaviors people had. Only 4.8% of people who were on a forum to talk about committing crime used a VPN. <laughs> So if that if that's the stat that people who are actively committing crimes are doing, like that for people who are engaged in less nefarious behavior, the adoption rate is pretty low. There are also tools that improve usability. So you have search engines, um, which have briefly existed on the dark web for a time. I'm going to talk about that more in the next slide. Um, forums, which can kind of which are sort of made to replace that kind of Yelp like oh, I need advice about how to do something. How do I get that? How do I find a community that I can trust? And then you also have things like plugins. Uh, there's a sort of a cycle with every dark web community or new marketplace where a new marketplace will be launched. The admins will think, I know how to set my marketplace away from aside from everyone else's. I know how to get new users. I'll use JavaScript. JavaScript makes e-commerce sites look really nice and functional. It's also terrible for security. It allows your devices to be fingerprinted. And so some, they'll introduce this beautiful, shiny new site 
that's so much more usable than all the other sites out there. And then they have this huge backlash because everyone's like, you have ruined our security. This isn't private at all. So there is this sort of trade off of the things that we consider integral to our normal clear web experience actually make the dark web more dangerous to use. I said I would talk a little bit about search engines. Here are a couple. Grams is the most, was the most famous, I think. It was specifically unifying um, essentially an e-commerce experience across a number of different marketplaces on the dark web. The dark web has these large multi-good marketplaces and um, it was trying to basically replicate the experience of when you go to Google and you can type something like, I want black sneakers and it will show you results from Amazon and Nordstrom and Zappos all together. So you can kind of, com you can compare things really easily. Grams was trying to do that for the dark web and it also had a list of vendors and it had a Bitcoin tumbler that paid for the rest of the, for all the rest of the infrastructure. There was also Torch and Fresh Onions. Those have been, a, those were a little bit more focused on kind of ephemera of, uh, of the dark web, more about the esoteric sites and a little bit less on the straight e-commerce functionality. What Torch and Fresh, on Fresh Onions actually still exist. They just are kind of poorly maintained. They can't really keep up with the changing topography. And then also, dark web search engines fail pretty frequently because it's a lot of work for not a lot of profit. The person who created Grams actually closed his search engine in 2017 saying, this is way too much work. And I don't, and like, it doesn't pay the Bitcoin Tumblr and the, pro like the donations don't pay for the work of maintaining the site. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they've attempt there. It isn't a very profitable enterprise. It turns out monetizing things on the dark web is approximately as hard as monetizing them on the clear web. There are also forums and communities. Since since uh, search engines have not really panned out in a big way, people have sort of shifted to forums and communities. Um, as a way of sort of replicating that, I don't know this information, who can I ask, who can I trust sort of mentality. But what we've, they've ended up in sort of a different dilemma there where um, it's, uh, it's easy to set up a forum on the clear web. There are a lot of sites that are, that are created to be able to let you set up forums, including Reddit, which for a while had a thriving dark web community of, for, of for, interlinked forums for different like sort of subsections of the dark web. However, hosting a, hosting a network of subreddits where you explicitly talk about how to commit crime did not turn out to be very popular with the Reddit admins and it was shut down earlier this year. So, but there are alternatives. Um, there's Dread, which is actually a Reddit clone that was created after the Reddit subreddits were shut down. The problem with that is that there were people who would stumble onto the subreddit or stumble onto clear websites because they were, they're already on the clear web looking for stuff. And then that's an entry point to the dark web. Because you can say like, oh, it's actually really easy. There are people here providing me with a guide on how to do this. On If something is already being hosted on a .onion site, suddenly there's no way to effectively stumble across it. Um, and then that prevents you from really building a new user base and building a new, um, actually like even buyer or purchaser base very quickly because you're cut off from the stream of new users. The Hidden Wiki and Deep Top Web also kind of serve this function because they're accessible um, through, the clear, through the clear web or through clear web mirrors. The problem is, again, like they're not, they're not as discussion focused. They're more just like lists of sites. A little bit less of like a forum community that builds trust between people. And these, I've been talking a lot about efforts from within the dark web to make the dark web more usable and more user friendly. Uh, obviously, people are trying to map the dark web from the outside. I work for a dark web um, security company that is interested in the kinds of conversations and the data trade that happens on the dark web. Uh, there also, academia has done several studies, including the one that I, I mean, not several, they've done a lot of studies, um, including the one that I talked about earlier where they were talking about um, the, the social and security dynamics of forum communities. And then also, the government facilitated the creation of the dark web and they do have a huge vested interest in keeping that infrastructure like functional while also discouraging the criminal communities that find refuge there. So law enforcement also has a huge vested interest in being able to understand the topography of the dark web. So we talked about these efforts to make the dark web easier to use both from inside and outside of the dark web. 
But what happens actually when the dark web gets easier to use? You may remember, you may recognize some of these logos. Silk Road was in the news. Alpha Bay and Hansa were in the news last year because they're all gone. <laughs> uh, when the dark web gets easier to use, uh, suddenly lots of people want to use it. And when lots of people want to use it, places like Wired and Motherboard and Gawker, RIP Gawker, all write about how about this cool new site. And then suddenly law enforcement realizes that perhaps they should not allow this site to exist anymore. And then it disappears. Um, however, the dark web is, con is, so you might think also then, OK, don't make the dark web easier to use. Make it more secure. Make everyone use Tails. Make everyone use a VPN. But there is this kind of constant tension. Users of the dark web want the dark web to be easier to use. Be making it more usable leads to a better e-commerce experience. And a lot of people are on the dark web for that e-commerce experience. Um, once it, improving the dark web means that more new people will come and try and use it. They will not go to their local drug dealer. They'll go to someone on the dark web who will ship something right to their door. Um, and then also, but then with this influx of new people, many of whom are inexperienced and may not know the best practices about using this, about using this technology, they are going to make mistakes. They're going to have poor operational security. It's going to lead to less security in general. And then, um, and then sort of cycle begins of more, less experienced people pushing it to be less secure and so on. So until law enforcement steps in, shuts down a site, and then it kind of ratchets back up as everyone realizes that they need to be more secure and more private on the dark web. I said I would come back to the slide. Here essentially is the trade-off with an approximate sort of placing of different examples of the ways that you can kind of have these conversations. Facebook isn't on here because Facebook would be like over by the door. But, um, so, but like imagine it off the screen. Um, and so you obviously have something like Facebook or Twitter where it's entirely public, free to join. Essentially, you can't really be banned effectively, although you can, because you can come back under like a pseudonym or a different identity. The public clear web forums like Edit, Reddit, um, 8chan, 4chan. Then you have private clear web forums, it's like a professional forum where you have to have a specific identity. You may have to pay to get access. Um, and so you do have to, there is some sort of barrier to entry, but it is on the clear web, which means there's not that technological barrier. Then you have these open dark web forums and marketplaces. I mentioned Thread. Some marketplaces will have forums, uh, and those are open to any registration. Some are even open to read. But they, there is that technological jump you have to get onto the Tor network. And then private dark web forums, Kick-Ass is, is an example, something where you have to either show expertise, show evidence of a crime, or pay money to join. And then finally, you might have been wondering during this talk, she's talking about committing crimes a lot, and the dark web does have this large criminal presence. Why not just use something like Telegram or Signal or even WhatsApp? I mean, that theoretically is the most secure option. But it doesn't work for a lot of these companies because you can't stumble across a conversation on Signal. You can't, look, you can't just be browsing around and think, oh, I think that vendor is great. I should think about buying something from them. Oh, I hadn't thought about buying this here. I should think about it. Oh, I hadn't thought about being in this community. It's entirely private. And there is this balance of like, these are, these are conversations that to a certain degree want to be happening in public. If it's, a, if it's an economic transaction, the people involved in it kind of want aspects of it to be public because they want customers. They want a little bit of publicity, but not too much. So I hope this spectrum is was illustrative sort of of what I've been trying to get across, which is that there are security and usability trade-offs for all these conversations that are taking place. There are security and usability trade-offs on the clear web as well. And it's something that we should be thinking about in general when we're when we are making these sort of choices about how secure and how private we want to be versus how much of a frictionless experience we want to have. And also that the paradox of popularity is alive and well on the dark web. There is this constant tension between we want new users, but not too much. We want more publicity, but not too much. Because there is this constant threat of being too prominent leads to law enforcement action, which effectively ruins their party.
I hope the, I hope that was an informative talk. I would love to take any questions if you have them. Otherwise, uh, you're free to contact me on my email or my Twitter. And if this was interesting to you, I am giving another talk about the dark web called Make Me Your Dark Web Personal, Personal Shopper tomorrow here at 1030.